All right, everyone, you guessed it. It's that time for coaches announcements. But before, I just want to say hitting 100 episodes is just epic. And I'm so blessed to have all of you here listening and taking in and writing your reviews and sharing and <clears throat> This next episode is going to blow you away. But before we get to it, uh, what are you doing for winter training? I know this is the time of the year. It's July going into August. Everybody is starting to think about what are we going to do to train for the winter, to keep up our cycling fitness and physique and get stronger for next year. Maybe you're thinking about goals already, like events you want to participate in because everything's opening up and things are coming back on. And so how are you going to get that training in? So what are you going to do to save some time? learn faster and get in some practice. So this is where I want you to take a really close look to at my cycling skills four week online workshop. It is for women. Um, but you know, I always take in dudes too. Um, and this is where you are going to get those specific skills that will take your fitness, whatever it is on the bike to the next level. And so the first week, it's all online, we have one webinar a week, and then we have one Q&A. And basically, you get me as a coach all month in the Facebook page. So the first week is dedicated to pedal stroke, because we got to start there. That's the foundation. Then we move to hills. How do you get better on the hills? That's the big question. People want to get stronger. How do you become stronger? Well, it's more about efficiency and pedal stroke, which is the first one. Third one is about speed. How do you get stronger? And we're going to talk about weight training. And the last one is all dedicated about nutrition. If you don't have good fuel... You're not going to go anywhere faster, period, no matter how skilled you are. So putting that all together, one amazing price you can, and it's over, and then you can start applying that outside. I have two workshops. I have one for September and one for October, and then we get into winter training, which I have something super amazing that's going to keep you motivated and moving forward over the winter. It's my signature. I just call it my 16 week road cycling program. That's indoor. We're going to incorporate in with Swift. And um, I've been running this for 15 years. Anyways, take a look cyclingskillspro.com for the four week and you just go to sylviedau.ca for everything. Anyways, I want you to enjoy this episode. It's super amazing. Let me know what you think. Have an amazing day. All right. Thank you everyone for coming out for another episode of Secrets in the Saddle, all things cycling podcast with your host, Sylvie Doe. And we have an extraordinary young lady here with us who is local to Ottawa. So she doesn't live very far from me, Lucy Hempstead. She is on her way to her Olympic dreams for 2024 is probably what you're looking at because well, this summer, but she has a really, and it, we're not only going to talk about Olympics and Olympics is great, but she's got a lot of other amazing things to share with us. Um, and I'm just so excited to have her here. Not only is she, um, she's, uh, racing for a pro team right now, but she, uh, went and trained for, to break the world records one out, no, sorry, 24 hour I wish it was one hour. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was <laughs> how fast you can go one hour. That'd be awesome. Go so 24 hour ride. Uh, she's going to talk about it. Um, I have links in the, in, uh, the, um, in the course notes where you can go and read more about her. But Lucy, we're so excited to have you here. I'm super excited to be here. I can't wait. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, I know we've been trying while. to get, get <laughs> nail each other. I've been trying to nail her down for a while. And we're just I'm really great, gra got grateful to have her here now. So I always love to start, um, start out the podcast uh, episode with our, our guests and asking like their story about how they got into cycling. So can you go yeah. all the way back to... <laughs> It's, I don't have to go very far back to when I, I know. started cycling because like, I grew up doing soccer and mostly cross country and everything. Like even back in like elementary school, I would run and all of that. That's how I kind of 
found my footing in athletics and how I started making friends and everything was way back in grade two. I just like ran and played soccer and really got into that and from soccer and everything I found out that I was like a little faster than most people my age. So as I grew up I started taking track and field a lot more seriously and yeah I'd like compete and train like a proper amount of hours like up until high school and university I'd be training like 20 to 25 hours a week of just running and weightlifting and all that stuff yeah for track and field what uh what events did you do I like growing up in elementary school and stuff I'd like dabble all through like cross-country distances to even just like the 100 and 200 because Mm -hmm. at that age I feel like you can't really specialize that early it's like putting all your eggs in one basket and being like, well, this is the way I'm going to go from age 12. Well, they usually like, put you in like, okay, how many events are you good at? And you're like, oh, yeah. Just- <laughs> like if there's no <laughs> limit, you may as well just do them all and see which one yeah, right. you can snag, yeah. you know? But I, as I started to get older and like things got a little more technical because it's like the age in which you peak in track is like a lot younger than in cycling, I think. Oh. because I started to like finite all my choices and everything in high school when I decided I wanted to be like a 400 meter hurdler because that was like kind of middle distance <laughs> I did distance. hurdles 400 yeah. meters yeah. 400 <laughs> meters and hurdles together it's like oh, oh okay okay I was like oh like 400 meter hurdles so 400 and you yeah. did the hurdles oh no 400 meter hurdles like together like it's 400 meters but there's like hurdles every 50 meters yeah it I don't sounds like it's doing be real, but it is. Is that new? It's, it's probably. I, I can imagine it'd be a little more recent. I did two hundred like, and one hundred, and that's those all. Those are brutal. I would just yeah. get my butt handed to me in those when I like as soon as oh. I got into high school and everybody started training like as hard as I was training for like the four hundred and the four hundred meter hurdles and like that kind of distance. People were training that hard for like the full out sprints, and I just did not stand a chance. Oh god. Because I just like couldn't put on the muscle. Couldn't like like I just didn't have the fast twitch. And I don't know, like growing like my whole family's background has always been endurance athletics and stuff like that. Okay. But because I did soccer, I thought that I had a pretty okay sprint. But I was proven wrong as soon as I got <laughs> into like a bigger pool of people that I hadn't yeah. grown up with my whole life. But yeah, so long story short, I didn't cycle at all until I was like 11 and I had this hybrid bike and it had training wheels on it and my dad was like you're learning to ride your bike now so we'd go up to the park and he'd be like get on the bike and just ride and with training wheels on I was still absolutely so bad at it like biking was never even a thought like I it was one of those things where I was like oh this is news to me that this is an actual sport that people like compete in the same way people do running because to right. me, running was like the sport. It was like what you think of when you think athletics. And it had become like my dream to be in the Olympics for that. And like I had Instagram handles growing up when I was 14 of like Lucy's Olympic dream. And it was just like full on. And I've said this in a couple of other interviews and stuff, but it's kind of embarrassing. But I remember being just so gutted when I found out that you couldn't actually get the Olympic rings like tattooed on you until you actually oh, go. Oh, yeah. who told you that? It was like the tattoo artist? Like, or, like... No, <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like adults and friends around me. But I was like, oh, because I just loved like I love the Olympics and like right. everything about it, like everything about it. I just like stay home from school to watch it. I was obsessed with it. And I was just like, yeah, I want the Olympic rings on me. Like, I haven't gone. I'm probably never going to go. But <laughs> and then I realized you only get them when you go. I was like, yeah. well, now I'm embarrassed. But I'd have like sharpied Olympic rings on my arm, like all through elementary school and everything like that. That's good. <laughs> but yeah, so doing track, I'm getting like off track here. But growing up doing track, that kind of um, like something that's really prevalent in like teenagers like mostly girl teenagers growing up in track and field environments is there's like an underlying kind of elephant in the room of eating disorders and just like needing to look a certain way to run a certain way and like there's like a little like a you feel like there's 
kind of like a body that you're supposed to fit in in order to be part of like some certain community like distance runners middle distance runners look a certain way and to be that good you need to look that way and I really just like spiraled down that and Good some coaches that I had weren't like the best about that they kind of like encouraged that behavior I was gonna ask where did it come from like it did it come from like your teammates or was it in like you said was it encouraged I mean because you're not very old and that's not very long ago no no it's still like very recent and yeah I definitely still like deal with those like intrusive thoughts like to this day but I didn't I trained with mostly guys growing up like in track and everything because there weren't a lot Mm -hmm. of girls in my club because I trained outside of school as well like in a club did you train at Terry Fox uh I went there a lot yeah but we also had like our own little gym I I trained with a club yeah but we had our own like gym and like these like self-powered treadmills and stuff so we'd go back and forth between the facilities and everything but yeah, just like social media and like seeing all the like actual pros and how they look and just like what you think that they do to train and like how you think they eat and like how you think they restrict. And it just like it turned into like wanting to eat healthy to restricting foods to restricting all foods to like oh. spiraling into an eating disorder. And because I was spiraling into an eating disorder, I was losing weight and I was losing weight at an ex financial rate and my coach was like you look great you're running amazing like your numbers are super good like hop on the scale we'll see like what your body fat percentage oh, is and no, he was just like really? feeding and yeah oh, like gosh. he would feed into all of the like really bad habits that I had kind of created and like I'm a creature of habits so I was just like running that routine that was like hurting me like into right. the ground and I, it was being like positively reinforced and like as a product of that I like had really really bad bone density and yeah like so I developed an eating disorder and like really bad like I was I had like the potential to have like osteoporosis and I had to go get bone density scans and all that kind of stuff this and like is the scary thing where they stuff inject- for kids yeah your age yeah I was now, like how did you fig- this was 2019 that, sorry I don't figure it out so. well how did you figure did you go for bone density testing or how did you so like figure out to go for everybody that? everybody started noticing like you don't look so good like you oh. look a lot different and when I didn't do well at me so it was like this is all for nothing like right now I'm waking up I'm like half of the person I used to be and it feels like the only thing that I'm supposed to do when I wake up is like think about training train or race and that's like all I'm capable of doing too because like I'm exhausted like my cortisol is up here and all of my other things are done like like reproductive system gone immune system gone being able to feel warm without like eight layers on gone like <laughs> are you talking right just, now like, you know <laughs> okay <laughs> I know I, I know it's cold outside because I'm just like I <laughs> No, no, no. This was this is like this back is when nice, I was okay, like in yeah. the midst of like the worst eating disorder of my life. Right. And then like all of that was happening and I was like, well, like I still feel like I look okay and my numbers when I'm racing are good. So there's no issues here. And my coach isn't telling me there's issues. And it wasn't until I started feeling like really horrible pains in my feet where I was like, maybe something is wrong so I went and I like got them looked at at the Carlton Ice House like at the um like the physio yeah. there yeah and I like was like yeah like my foot's really hurting me whenever I put weight on it like it's getting kind of swollen she was like you need to get this x-rayed or for sure you do this might be stress fractures and I was like Gosh. oh uh oh. So I get them checked out and eventually find out that I had a stress fracture in my right navicular and then four different stress fractures in my metatarsals in both my feet and mm-hmm. also a stress, like two stress fractures, like forming in my pelvis. So I had like almost 10 stress fractures and one like really bad one in my navicular, which is the one that like ultimately led me to getting checked out. Right. Where's but okay? Yeah, like, where's, the, where's that bone? Is that in the top? Of your uh, it's like, you know, like the big pad under your big toe. 
Yeah. Like the ball of your foot, that's like oh, below your big toe, right. not bone. So it's kind of okay. like, feels like the big ball bone behind your big toe. Yes. And then the, the navicular, the metatarsals are all like the little toe bones. Ooh. But the navicular is like the bigger one mm -hmm. on like the far inside. But yeah, weird. There's a lot of foot bones, but I had like fractures in so many of them in both my feet and then also my pelvis which was not good and I ended up having to train in an air cast and I was like how am I going to keep a ball of this intensity while I have all these stress fractures so I like was going to a liquid gym which is like where you run on yeah. treadmills underwater yeah. and like bike underwater and do all that mm -hmm. stuff and the only way that I me and my coach could kind of like figure out how to get me to do the same intensity and like work as hard as I would be running was to do intervals on like a like a stationary bike oh and like go to spin classes at Mavadi and stuff like that so those are the only ways that I could like actually feel like I was getting the intensity that I'm used to right so that's like how I started training on a bike was kind of like being forced into it yeah but I just like I got so used to doing all of my interval workouts on like spin bikes that it's like, <laughs> I, like I just like, like I knew this. how to do it and stuff. <laughs> I was like this is kind of okay like I don't mind this and I'm not in like excruciating foot pain afterwards and then like they kind of went on like that for a bit like my stress fracture started healing I had had a lot of like work to do with the eating disorder and like going to therapy and like trying to just like push those thoughts aside and I still deal with that a lot but I went to a lot of therapy and like have been in and out of a lot of like people helping me and like nutritionists mm -hmm. and dietitians and just like all that kind of stuff and it's a really long journey and by no means is it over but I but have like a way all, better how old were you when all this started it's like 2019 so like you're what 2018 like I was like 17 18. 17 okay like late 17 and then all of 18 was like this whole this whole thing right so when you just when you when you went to the x-rays and you found out all these stress fractures and then found out about your bone density is that when you kind of fired your coach no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> I mean essentially I like fired myself from the sport mentally I was like I yeah, am checking true. out like, why am I waking up every day dreading workouts, dreading all of this stuff? Right. I feel like if I don't win races, I feel useless because it's like, well, mm. I put myself in this hole and like, I'm not even doing well and I hate being here. And I was just like, <laughs> it felt like it was my job because like I, I told you, like at that point, like my whole life I had been running. So I felt right. like I was totally just defined by running. Like the only thing that I was right. in this world was a runner and that's right. how I made friends that's how everybody knew me that's like how I had it's like that's who I was to everybody right. and to myself and I was like I am just a runner and if I can't run what am I mm -hmm. so I was so scared to leave running and oh. the only thing that got me to leave running was my mom signed me up for RBC training ground which was kind of like RBC training ground is kind of like you know in gym when they do like a bunch of fitness tests mm -hmm. on you and you get like points and everything like that that's kind of what rbc is and from all of those tests like the beep test which is what i did really really well on and like some little sprints and like verticals and stuff like that and just like a dead weight pull and all that kind of stuff um oh. they take your points from that and they kind of see like okay like what niche sport would this person like be good at that they would never really think to do like there was rugby there was still track and field there was speed skating there's oh. obviously cycling there was rowing there's like all these sports that aren't like immediately what you think you're going to put your kids into like hockey or soccer or whatever so uh two guys from cycling canada approached me after my beep test because i had like won it and posted like one of the best times for the day across all genders and they were like we really think that like your body type and your endurance and like all these strengths that we've seen would really allow you to excel in cycling and I was like that's weird because I like have never ridden a bike ever in my life except for recently when I had to <laughs> and like that one didn't have two wheels like it wasn't gonna fall over <laughs> or anything I was like I don't know if I can even ride a freaking bike <laughs> like I don't know if I can ride as a group 
Like I talk about it with my coaches now. Like you talk to Sean Clark. Like you've you've interviewed him. Yeah. And, How long have you been working with him? Uh, so with RBC, when I won the funding and everything, like part of that was they provide me with a coach and all that. Right. So I was lucky enough to get him as a coach mm-hmm. when they when they assigned us that kind of thing. So yeah, we've been working, and I like I'll bring it up to him and be like, "Holy crap!" Like look at like where I am now like with the record and like I have a team and he's like you do nothing <laughs> back on our like first ride together he's like you knew nothing <laughs> like I don't even understand how you can possibly like be riding on a bike now because like you can have your fitness and everything but if you don't know like mechanics behind a bike or like right. how to ride it <laughs> or like how to change a flat or like what's the difference between rim and disc like I knew nothing I knew nothing well this so, is like, awesome because if you know nothing and look where you are now imagine what everybody yeah. else could do seriously well yeah it's true <laughs> and like I was like like when RBC picked me for the funding and I went to Milton they did some extra testing which was like in Milton when I did like some extra testing and stuff they put us on like track bikes uh, like on the velodrome like uh-huh. <laughs> ones where you can't stop pedaling or you'll yeah, yeah. fly off that was like the first time I had ever been on a bike a with drop bars b without like training wheels or like <laughs> stuff like that and I just like they put us on the velodrome on these bikes and I was like Whoa. like what what <laughs> and it was so fun like it was the most fun I'd ever had I did not crash it was the best day of my life I was like okay I love this I want to do this I'll let people fund me to do this Uh, this yes me please I'm okay like this is it was so fun it was just I was on a buzz from it for like weeks after I was just so in it and I was like, okay, I need to now know everything about this sport. Like I need to yeah. just fully throw myself in it. So I got a job at my local bike shop, the cyclery. Which oh is like, gosh, you're a cyclery girl too. Jeez. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you talked to Ariane too, eh? Right? So. Uh, Ariane, Jenny, like, I'm like, yeah. what? It's like, I mean, it's been a massive hub for a yeah. lot of elite style women like Jenny was oh. just a I remember when I was racing and I was coaching and I heard of Jenny and then I heard I, the first time I've heard of her was when she started working with the OBC and then the OBC yeah. she went to cyclery and uh and then I'd see her coaching and I was like oh my gosh look at this girl like I was just I when I interviewed her I'm like I was always in awe of you every time I saw you oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's so, it's weird though. It's like such a small world because Sean worked there, Mike Woods yeah. worked there. Like Vince is well, great. He's been super I, uh, supportive and like super patient with like me starting working there and everything. And like literally, like, I remember one of my coworkers was, I was like, okay, teach me bikes. Like just give me a crash course on bikes oh, so yeah. I can like be productive. <laughs> you like, uh, and she me. like, yeah. <laughs> she, I remember her trying to explain to me the difference between Shimano and SRAM and like the difference between like 105 Altegra and Durace and I was like uh, like what are you talking about right now <laughs> this is like, a crash I course Lucy come on I was so lost I was so lost but now I can like confidently sell a bike and like do work on my own bike and like mm-hmm. compare different parts and different like just, I, like I know what I'm talking about now and it's been like a year because awesome. I've just like I've prioritized like throwing myself into the sport like full in because mm-hmm. I want to like feel like I deserve to be here and feel like I I earned everything that comes to me and I want to feel like established and everything I don't want to just have this all kind of fall into my lap and not know what to do with it well it makes so you I, feel more like knowledgeable I, I feel like I've gotten like myself good. there yeah yeah, like I want to be able to like, give advice and like help other people who, when RBC is able to do more national finals and stuff like that, like people who are like thrown into a sport and know nothing about it, they can like you can still learn <laughs> and people want to help you. Like the community of cycling is 
so incredible. That's like mm-hmm. one of the main things I've realized is how welcoming everybody, even in just like Ottawa, Gatineau area, everybody is so welcoming and so willing to share their knowledge and share some of their equipment and share roots and tips and advice. And it's just been really, it's made the whole transition really easy, really easy and just like way more enjoyable. Nice. So are you, um, all right. So we've got a lot, we talked to RBC, RBC. Are you going to school or you pull full-time cyclist right now? So I have one year of university under my belt. I did uh, my first year in women's studies and criminology at U Ottawa. Oh, and that was when I was still, cool. that's when I was still doing track a little bit. So I was on the roster for a track there and did like my first U, uh, U sports slash OUA season with U Ottawa. That's like kind of while I was transitioning with the RBC stuff because they like overlapped a little bit. Yeah. So I did my first year and then COVID happened and everything. And I decided to okay. take a gap year right. just because I wasn't really like I wasn't feeling my program. I kind of felt like I was just doing it for the sake of doing it. And I didn't actually mm-hmm. like, don't get me wrong, totally care about women's studies and crim. <laughs> but I just, I'm all about women's studies, but I was just not really, like, it felt like I was doing it because everybody wanted me to. Mm. So I took a step back from that and kind of worked and just, like, put, got my foot more in the door with cycling and prioritized those things because it seemed like the right thing to do when I couldn't really even go into school to be there. Right, yeah. Um. So I did that and recently I just got accepted into a two-year online program at Algonquin now that I'm going to start in September. So I will be going back to school. It's a two-year program online for fitness promotion. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I figured that'll be super cool. I kind of have like a little bit of an idea of where I want to take that Mm -hmm. eventually, kind of maybe down a more like business route or something like that. Oh, gosh. But yeah, um, that's kind of what I'll be doing in September because that way I can do it remotely too. Yeah. If there's, if slash hopefully when there's racing, you get to go to the states so, and race. <laughs> yeah, hopefully Europe too. Like that would be ah that would yeah. Be go see Sean. Great goal. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> oh, I'm stuck in Spain. I'm like, oh, be quiet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sucks to be you, right, Sean? Yeah, that sucks to be you. Yeah, I'm jealous. So, all right. So you're going to be going back to school. That's cool. I always big promoter of, of education. Um, yeah. And like, we're excited. female cyclists are like in no way, shape or form paid enough where like, you can just be a cyclist. It sucks. But like, I've like yeah, done a well, lot of realizing. Hopefully lately, that like, will change. I, yeah. In your like, next decade. That changes, <laughs> yeah. That would be ideal. But like recently I've like, discovered I need to have like education slash like a backup plan to kind of have like my own other career and like that kind of thing mm-hmm. the side hustle yeah the side hustle because you going. look at like the female peloton and like everybody is like doctors or engineers and, stuff oh like that. and it's insane it's like you have all it's of these crazy. like incredibly talented men who are just on cyclists and that is their job and they're everything and like that's all they do and then you look at the women's world tour and it's like they're also badass amazing cyclists that are like doing incredibly well in races and everything and they're also doctors and they're also oh, engineers they're, and they're also yeah. scientists and moms and like single yeah. moms and like it's just like wow I know, <laughs> I know awesome. it is wow I better <laughs> start doing more than just working at a bike shop <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> well I think that's a good place to start but you are definitely yeah. right like keeping the education mm-hmm. on like going as you go is pretty important because you don't know when that train's gonna end right yeah exactly it, it could be a freak accident or something and I, I hate to say yeah. things like that but you have to be thinking about what yeah if. like you have you like it's fun to have your head in the clouds but you have to kind of be realistic about it sometimes because like things like COVID, like yeah, that took away a like a year and a half of potential. That took a year, like a, a year and a half of potential racing that I could have done and just like, mm-hmm. it didn't happen. So. so let's segue from talking about COVID 
you gave yourself a, a goal of training for this world record 24 hour, how many, as many kilometers as you can go in 24 hours. So the yeah. record was 680 and yeah. you crushed it only by 200 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wow. That entire, yeah, 812 kilometers is no joke, even on Zwift. Like, yeah. So, is, talk about this. Like, how did you, uh, is that so? How long did you train for this? And so, you know, I didn't right, actually, cool. because I was doing so much base, like right. the way I was training was like a lot of base. Like, mm -hmm. I try to do like 20 or so hours and stuff. Like, every Even week though, like, right? bike, yeah. like with weights and running and biking and everything like it ends up being like usually at least 20 hours yeah total so I had a lot of base under me and we we're out like Toronto Hustle has now annually like the last year and this year done a crush COVID thing which is like a 24-hour relay on Zwift so everybody will sign up for these shifts because we do them in two-hour segments on right. Zwift as like kind of Zwift events so you can sign up and then you'll do two hours. You can sign up and do four hours. And like the way our team would do it is kind of like a relay kind of thing. So uh -huh. like two people would do one of the two hours or they'd do like four hours back to back. And just like, as long as you have two shifts during the whole 24 hours, like yeah. you participated, that's great. Like raise money. It was a big focus on the charity and everything, especially this year with it being for the, the mental health, um, the MG the yeah the mental health foundation and everything for michael garen hospital okay so yeah where was i going with that um no you're talking about the um, uh trinal hustle 24 yeah, hours yeah. swift so did you just so, do yeah, that like, we all had to do hours at we the all same had to do shift and our one coach brad last year he did the full 24 hours oh, okay he's like a city counselor for toronto and everything hmm. and like super involved and was like I'll do the full 24 hours it'll be great and another one of our athletes Travis Samuel he was like well I'm gonna go for the world record like for 24 hours so he did that he actually ended up getting it I'm pretty sure and then Brad just did it for the 24 hours which is also ridiculous but didn't even go for the record <laughs> he just would pedal and like interviewed everybody and stuff and then <laughs> this year we did it again because COVID is still here yeah well there's no racing we'll do it again it was great like for raising money for charity and it did like oh, it only only good things came of it so why not so we all did it again and I was like what if I went for the 24-hour record like when I do things I love to just like fully do them like I love to do them all out and to me it was like like I was like well why wouldn't I do 24 hours like I think I can do that because a little more context last year Last September, with my team Toronto Hustle, the way that I get I guest rode for them to kind of get onto the team was we did a ride from Toronto to Ottawa, called oh. Capital to Capital, cool. which was it ended up being like 435k. We did it in 13 and almost 14 hours. Yeah, we left at like 3 a.m. Got to Ottawa eight. We pit stopped in Kingston. What's it called? Tweed. Brenton? Tweed. Oh, tweed. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's like yeah. the smallest town stop. ever. <laughs> oh yeah. They have a subway though. There's... They have a subway. And we well, were, we, <laughs> we hit up that subway. There's like a picture of me eating like the saddest little gluten free sub under a tree, and I just oh. look so so cracked because we're like 230k in I am like 100k is over the longest ride I had ever done because like my longest ride up until that point Sylvie I was like I threw myself into this when my longest ride up to that point was the uber pretzel route on Zwift oh god <laughs> <laughs> like up until that point my longest ride was like five hours of like totally like inflated Zwift algorithm like speed like you know how when you like go on Zwift and you push like zone two and it's like you're going 38 kilometers an hour <laughs> yeah because it's flat and there's no wind yeah. so I did the uber pretzel on Zwift which is like 150 something k or whatever 
and that was my longest ride and I was like well I can do this capital to capital thing yeah that's started. right <laughs> so I went and did that in like 230k and I was like this is not Zwift and this is double my this longest is- ride and I feel my ass hurts <laughs> less than excellent right now yeah well, like I was, I was like I was doing great. We were all averaging. How like, many of you? Because there was like, there was like ten of us. Okay, that's a good it like size a, it was group a great to bunch. rotate through. Yeah, and like I was learning everybody's names and like getting to know everyone. <laughs> so I had lots to talk about, and it like it was like as as fast as like fourteen hours in the saddle can fly by. It did feel like it flew by. Mm-hmm. And it was really it was super fun like it made me realize that like I love that kind of thing like super long sorry super long like endurance kind of riding and all that like just like weird projects where you like go and do things <laughs> for an entire day Seems we did one like that like. over swift like I think it was um it was a century it was like the the pretzel or something I can't remember mm-hmm. what it was. Anyways, there was like 12 of us on Swift mm-hmm. and on Facebook uh, chat, Messenger yeah. Facebook chat. So we're all there and it, it's like seven and a half hours. We had three 15 minute stops. Yeah. And I'm like, that was the longest I'd been on my, on the trainer. Like, I think I did like an hour and a half, two hours was like the longest ride. I'm like, yeah, because why would you be on the trainer for longer than that? I know, seriously, I've I've done centuries before, so I I know I'm capable of going that far. But like you said, on a on a trainer is a different story. By yourself, well, and we work by yourself. It's like the most uncomfortable you'll ever be on your bike. Yeah, exactly. There's no way for it not to hurt. (laughs) Yeah, but we did it. So you guys made it to Ottawa. And then yeah. you decide to do the 20, the uh, 24 hour record. Yeah. So like I got on the team because I had done that guest ride and everything. And they're like, okay, oh. like she's willing to, like, she's willing to like be a part of this team and she wants to guest ride and she kept up and she can ride in a group and all that stuff. And like, I had made the connections and got along with the team. So because there's no racing, that was like how I guest rode, which is yeah, yeah. a pretty unique way to guest ride, <laughs> like one yeah. hell of a guest ride, Fun. but it went super well. So like, <laughs> As a result, I got on the team, and then I was like, like that same mentality that I had, where I was like, yeah, I'll do this capital capital thing with zero experience. I was like, <laughs> why won't I be able to ride twenty four hours? Like, I can stay awake for twenty four hours, so I can ride for twenty four hours. <laughs> so, you did half. Yeah, like more than half. So I was like, well, we had gotten no sleep that night too because we stayed up watching the Raptors lose. So I was like, well, I did all of that in like twenty four hours, basically. So. I was fully convinced that I could do this for some reason. <laughs> I was like, why wouldn't I be able to do this? Like, I wasn't even thinking about the record yet. I was just like, I think I can do this. And it like, it wasn't until one of our, one of my teammates in the chat was like, what's the girls world record? And I was like, I don't know, should I go oh. for it? So we looked it up and like, we contacted Guinness and we filled out the whole like legit application process and like, got that all approved and like sent a bunch of paperwork in and paid and blah blah blah. like we got it all like super verified so it's all legit and everything and Uh they told us that the previous record um was a girl in I think Saudi Arabia she's a cyclist in Saudi Arabia who's also like been a runner before um (laughs) but it was 680k that was the previous record and I was like I did like the math and everything and I was like if I roll at 30 kilometers an hour for 24 hours I will get at least 700k yeah and and well you did almost 513 hours so mm-hmm. what's another 20 yeah exactly I was like, yeah, you're like ah. and so I was like I can do this I just have to sit on my bike <laughs> and stay in a draft and do 30 kilometers an hour so we like organized it so like we made like a big group chat and like made like a google sheet about who would ride when so i'd always have people to ride with and like always oh have a cool wheel. okay so we had like people to help me right at the start and like there was a night shift of people like i had people um riding with me from like 10 p.m to 4 a.m oh cool. and we were all just awake and texting and everything and like it was the weirdest part though of the like whole thing was like the day leading like because we started at 6 p.m yeah we did six to six 
So the entire like day of Friday until six, I was like, what do I do? <laughs> like, should oh, I go so for a walk started? or like, should I just eat like all day? <laughs> Or will I just regret that at 3 a.m. when I need to go to the freaking washroom? And like, I just, I was like, how do you prepare for this when it's at 6 p.m. and you have like right. an entire day? Like, should I sleep? Should I? I just had no idea what to do. Cause I was like, this could easily turn into like a 40 hour day. If oh, I don't oh yes. Yeah, you're right. Huh. So I was like, what do I even do? So I just like, I essentially laid on the couch and ate food all day until the time came and like tried to nap. And that like, I went out for like, mm -hmm. I was like, this is the most intense carb loading. Like I felt like crap going into it. I was just like so full. So like (laughs) I hadn't done a thing, like 10 steps max that day. Like I hadn't done a thing. I felt so weird going into it. I did I did like a test ride to make sure the stream and everything worked like the night before but like Sean and I were like yeah just let's, let's just not do anything because you're about to do something for 24 hours yeah so let's just not like let's just not do anything I don't <laughs> think you need to warm up for this like you're not gonna be like doing zone anything for the whole 24 hours so right. you don't really need to warm up for it so yeah, like I remember getting on at six and being like, woo, everything's happening. And there was like a big Zoom call with Brad and all of the people he's interviewing. So that was like, it was like super fun. And like, everyone was like super down with it at, for the first two hours. So those flew by. And then like 10 PM rolls around and I'm like, okay, I've been doing this for like four hours, feeling pretty good. It's dinner time. Like I'll eat dinner, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and like, then it gets to be like 12 and most of the people who started like went to bed and that's when everybody who was going to ride with me during the night like started getting on this lift and we were like okay let's settle in like we have a long night ahead of us and everyone was telling me that the night shift was going to be the worst part and that was going to be the hardest part and that's when you're going to feel your darkest but like because all of my favorite people rode with me all night and it was just so Ah. good the whole time (laughs) Like, it was so fun the whole time. I was just, like, I had, like, my best friend Kim with me the entire time who stayed for the whole, like, she came over to, because I did the thing at my dad's girlfriend's house. Okay, like that's out, what you did. Out in Richmond, yeah, like, out in Richmond so that I wouldn't be, because at, at my house, my pain cave is just, like, essentially a shed in the basement <laughs> with, like, a window, like, the <laughs> smallest window you've ever seen. Like the tiniest window. Just Something you can like, see a little bit of sunshine, I think. Yeah, I think. it's like those doors where like you knock on the door and people open that sliding door to like put their eye and see oh. who's there. That's like, that's like the window that we have in the basement. It's essentially to make sure that the outside world is still there. <laughs> it's like the only way of checking. So I was like, I don't think it would be like, I don't think I could get this cleared by anyone if I like wanted to do this in the basement. I don't think it would be okay for like my sanity <laughs> to be alone in this basement for 24 hours. Yeah. So I went out to my dad's call. girlfriend's place. Yeah. And we really like set it all up in the living room where there's like a gazillion windows and like art and like flowers and like a kitchen and people <laughs> and like room for people and like just, yeah, it was a much better situation. I'm really glad we did that. So like, I had my dad and his girlfriend and her kids and my best friend Kim there the whole time with me, like kind of yeah. as witnesses and as like just like comfort and support. Uh-huh. I'm gonna talk to feeding you. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like oh, <laughs> I'll get to that. There was some serious oh, no! like force feeding that happened, <laughs> but yeah. So all through the night, I had people on Zwift like like my favorite people ever were like riding with me through the night, like some teammates, just like people really close to me riding with me. And it was just like, the night was the most fun. Like the night was the best part in my opinion, like from like 10 to 5 a.m. I was like, this is amazing. I'm having so much fun. When it's six, it'll be halfway. We'll be chilling and it'll be awesome. And then it's like home stretch. In my brain, I was like making up wild wild ways for me to be like oh I'm almost done like I'm yeah. one quarter of the way but how did it feel when you hit like that that 680 you're like ma oh, I'm you, like you'd think you'd think that I felt amazing really but 
oh my god when it hit like at 6 a.m or at four like okay so everybody who rode with me through the night called it in between four and six a.m they were like okay we're going to bed we did the night shift everyone's waking up now goodbye and then <laughs> you're like no everyone went to sleep and, and no one woke up <laughs> from from 6 a.m to 8 a.m for that two hour stage I was completely alone on Swift. Oh, like riding by myself on Swift. You're like everyone, nobody, everyone in the, in the UK, house. Anyone? Anyone? No, like because I guess like everybody, anyone who was supposed to ride with me from like six to eight, like either didn't or didn't sign up. So I was literally like alone, trying to keep my average at thirty. Twelve or thirteen hours into the ride, I'm like by myself everyone in the house is still asleep and i'm just like bonking sylvie i <laughs> am bonking like no. i was up all night i wasn't hungry because it was the night i was just like eating scratch right. gummies, oh like, breakfast literally like just scratch gummies i was just like these it's like candy yay it's like the middle of the night who cares no one needs to be when it's the middle of the night like i had <laughs> so much food around me i had so much food around me like more food than you've ever seen. I'll try and send you some emails because we took like with pictures in it because we took pictures of all the oh really food around it. <laughs> so I, you, I you got like a selection. I've got like bagels and stuff over here and Danish. It was like a farmer's market. It was like oh, okay. control. Could you finish? And I just, like, reach it? <laughs> I just opted for all of the like all the scratch gummies in the world. So then oh by my 6 a.m. I'm just like bonking, like nauseous, don't want to eat. I'm like there's, I had to film the whole thing. Like I had to live stream the whole thing kind of as like a proxy. So there's like, there's the full footage on my Facebook page of the whole live stream. If you oh go my God. to like oh, 24 hours. Yeah. Split wow. up into like eight hour segments. Cause like we have to have it. Like we didn't have a proxy right. there and we had proof of like the fact that I was the one that did all of it. Yeah. So if you go on my Facebook page and look at the clip, that would be like when it was 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. All that you can see is me like hoisting myself up on my saddle in tears, like just Aww. crying, like sobbing and like pushing myself off my saddle because I'm in so much pain. And I'm just like, it's just like a good like 45 minutes to an hour of me just like sobbing sobbing and bonking and just being so alone and that was like the worst part of the whole and then your thing. dad wakes up hey and then I what had happened was like I called one of my teammates slash like mentors slash like best friends in the whole world I called Graham Rivers he's on my team and I was like I don't feel so good <laughs> like this is the worst day of my life I feel nauseous I can't eat I don't want to eat like why am I doing this I feel I don't like I don't know what's gonna happen next I feel so bad that I am scared about what's going to happen next <laughs> like oh. will I just fall off of this bike like you know when you feel so broken and you're like I don't know how I could, this could get worse but if it does I don't know what's what I, like, I'm like <laughs> yeah. you have to stop and he was like you need to eat food like you need to eat something right now like actual food in your body you need to do it oh yeah oh no so I like I get my dad and he's like whatever you want like what do you want and I was like waffles like I need uh. waffles right now <laughs> so they made me they made me waffles and they put like endurance tap syrup on it and like butter and I like oh. and then you just see me like eating waffles with my hands <laughs> like on the live stream <laughs> just like fully <laughs> eating bites of waffles Sticky. with my hands oh yeah <laughs> Like, it doesn't even matter. Like, I don't care that people are watching this live stream. I just need these waffles in my face as fast as they'll go in my face. Oh, God. So I'm, like, I'm doing that. And then, like, I start to feel a little better. Graham comes over and visits me with his kiddos. And, like, just, like, from 9.30 p.m. Uh, a.m. onwards, I just, like, exponentially feel better. And, yeah, like, around 2 p.m., we broke the 680k mark, which was like a huge morale boost. Every, like a lot of people were around for that. Like Kim was there, my dad was there, Graham was still there. And everyone was like, holy crap, you just beat the actual record. Like, And you got right like two hours to go. 
what are you gonna do it's like, like four hours I like four, four hours. hours to go I was like I guess we just see how far we can get it now and like I was feeling great like I was like I did what I came here to do if I wanted I could just like mail it in but I don't want to I want to like push it like I was just so glad that I had done it because I was scared like that morning when I was like alone I was like what if I never have anyone to ride with to the rest of this whole thing and I'm just like gonna screw the pooch and not finish this thing (laughs) that's it I'm done I was so I was so scared I was like this is the end of it but yeah once I broke the record that had originally been standing I was like okay I can do this and then like more people that I like loved started coming and visiting and like staying around for the end and like champagne was getting brought out and like food was getting <laughs> brought out and it's like it was 5 p.m and I was like there's an hour left oh no and way then, it's the countdown and then it looked like and then it looked like I was gonna hit 800k and we were like Whoa. keep going like yeah everyone was like this has now turned into a oh my god you can hit 800 you need to hit 800 so I started yeah. like actually trying like trying You're actually to, like, trying to like, I started like trying to push like more water oh, okay like, yeah yeah a consistent pace because mm-hmm. like plan a had been just like just hold like at least 100 ish and like average a certain amount sorry average a certain speed and just like get yourself there yeah but now I was like well screw that I'm just gonna actually like I'm pushing now I only have an hour left I'm gonna have rest after this so yeah like really <laughs> so yeah like the time just like keeps ticking down and we hit 812 and like we all celebrated and there was champagne and music and uh, I remember getting off my bike and like my legs were shaking and I slammed an entire like box of pizza and then I just like <laughs> I had to sleep I tried watching Hercules. How many times? So how many times like, did you? Here. Yeah. Did you? How many times did you change your shorts? Did you? Um. Yeah. Every. So every two hours, I went to the washroom because that was like the break between stages. So I like, you know, when you're like on Zwift and yeah. you have like joined an event and it counts down. Like yes, when you can go join it. Oh yeah, you got like five minutes. minutes or two minutes or yeah. something. And like if you like once there's like three, two minutes left, it automatically joins you to the next event and like brings you to that pen and you wait there. So whenever it like started counting me down to go to the pen, oh okay, for the next stage, I'd get off, go to the washroom, and every two stages I'd change bibs. Right. So every every four hours I'd change bibs. Okay. And then, like, they would do, like, a load of laundry after, like, I had gone through two pairs so that I could go back to the original ones because I didn't want to, yeah. like, have a whole variety. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, yeah. Uh-huh. The, gross, the gross part is I stayed in the same socks and shoes the whole time. Yeah. Do you have multiple s- shoes? Well, I had, like, I no. <laughs> I had, like, two pairs of shoes. <laughs> I had like the shoes that I like my team gave me like for our sponsor this year and then I had like my older shoes and I like I wore the sponsor shoes like I wore my Shimano shoes and they were fine like they're super comfortable so I was like okay I don't need to change but I stayed in the same sock which I think is kind of (laughs) gross. I was like like, what's uh, that? It's like the longest I've ever worn any piece of clothing. (laughs) Well see I don't even wear socks when I cycle. People are like we don't wear socks. I'm like fair enough I mean like that's like have you ever done triathlon that's like all of I've done two to say mm-hmm. I've done two and then I decided they weren't for me fair enough <laughs> I moved all the triathletes don't wear socks yeah I don't know I don't think it's because of that I just never I don't like the tan lines fair they are funky it, well the tan, tan lines, lines down at, at your ankles and then on your thighs and then on your arms I'm like I kind of like to look a little feminine in the summer mm-hmm. not like have the the cycling like a, yeah hero. yeah no I'm okay like the with farmer's that. 10 times 10 like yeah. farmer's 10 on your legs as well it's really yeah. ridiculous I even I'm starting to get a tan on my hands now. oh yeah and then I I it's like I stopped wearing the 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 gloves so that you yeah. know your your fingers don't get tan I'm like no I'm not I don't even wear I don't even wear gloves and I'm still getting a tan from like where I'm like holding my bars and their sun isn't on, oh like, funny fingers. 
it's just on my hand I'm like I can't even avoid this yeah like, I, I got can't the watch the tan without... this tan I'm like no so all it's right so you've job. done this it was a huge success I mean that's mm -hmm. you made the news and um you've got your team so now Lucy like we took we are just talking a little bit before we started but your steps okay so I have to mention our cycling club honored mm -hmm. Lucy with a bursary fund of $1,500 to go towards her racing. And maybe you can tell me, so that's Cycle Fit Chicks. Um, mm -hmm. We raised money, oh gosh, like I've had my club for 13 years. We raised money, I don't know, five, six years ago. And then we never gave it to an athlete. And now we're like, we got to get rid of this money. And we pick Lucy, but she's so amazing. And oh. one of our other uh, local racers, which is Emily Flynn, and you can, her episodes in, uh, has been, is in the, the podcast. But so what are you going to, now, in order to get to the Olympics, now, mm -hmm. are you going to, are you going to go back to the track or are you going to do it on the road? Like what's, what's your plan and how are you going to like what kind of steps do you have getting yourself further up the line, like to pro and to Europe? And like, do you have kind of, um, kind of like a plan? I mean, yeah, like in a my perfect rough world right now. <laughs> yeah. COVID. Oh God, a perfect world. Like, right. Like for to answer the first question, I definitely pursue road. That's just like more catered towards my strengths. I think like, right. I think like my the long endurance. Are, like, yeah, endurance, like stage racing, stuff like that, like long one day races, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. The more climbing, the better for me mm. and stuff like that. Like that's kind of where my strengths lie. Um, so for me, what I just need to do is race. I need to race, um, upgrade my like category, upgrade mm. like my like overall standings, like get my name out there get on some like um some higher level teams and just kind of work my way up the ladder until I can get to being kind of like pro or conti pro stuff like that yeah and then from there just work on being selected for teams and all that stuff right because I um when I interviewed Emily she talked a lot about uh, applying for mm -hmm. races and I know like you need like literally need um results to go yeah with like that's all your, like you yeah. like we've created a power like I have power profiles like power files to share and everything like that but at the end of the day I just need to go and like race as much as my calendar will let me race right and like do as well as I can mm -hmm. and apply for the races that are a little higher up there right like there's some races in September that I'm really hoping I get to do and championships just like, like nationals yeah stuff like that oh well, definitely yeah. nationals yeah hopefully green mountain stuff like that okay yeah um so yeah just like getting into the more the most competitive races that I'm able to get into mm -hmm. and holding my own and doing well and stuff like yeah. that yeah so maybe this is for my club what are you going to use the money for the 1500 the definitely, fun. definitely <laughs> getting to as many races as I can get my hands on. Just I know. Like getting, because once like the vaccines are being able to be set up a little bit, so as soon mm -hmm. as I have my second dose, I'll be able to get to those kind of like more international ones. Right. Or kind yeah, of, I, I maybe just situate myself in a place like where there will constantly be races all around me that I can just go to all of them and all that stuff. Right. Now, um, with regards to your team, like, do they have a race schedule that's kind of set up or are they kind of, what kind of, um, what kind of races do they hit? So for my team, uh, the, the way that we do it is we have this like group chat for, called like early season planning and everything. Mm -hmm. And it has the men's team, which is like our focus. And then I'm in it as well with a couple of the girls because we have like a men's road team and then we have a women's uh gravel team oh and then okay. I'm I'm like the only woman on the road team 
Mm-hmm. So I will go to all of the races that the men go to because they'll be doing mostly road. Like they're looking at, sorry. Um, they're looking at, um, I lost my train of thought. They're looking at races like Charlevoix and- Oh, uh, is that uh, still happening? Some of the, like the Quebec races are happening. Yeah, I know. Uh, they um, as of June twenty sixth. Mm-hmm. Anything after that? Yeah, because we have I'm pretty sure it. what's happening because like we're signed up for Big Red, but I think all of us are gonna try and get out of that maybe because Charlevoix would happen. Mm-hmm. And yeah, G- a good one. like yeah, and like GP Contrecoeur and like uh, all that like the the Quebec race calendar we're trying to get to, mm-hmm. and if we can get. If we can get across the border, like Intelligentsia would be great. Would it be a great block of races to do? Is that just in New York like, State? I think, yeah. Yeah. Or, or down sh- near Chicago? Ba- Chicago. Um, that's De- no, it's not Detroit. That's Tulsa. But it's not right? New York. Yeah. But that's down from mm-hmm. Toronto. Yeah, just like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So just yeah. all of the like all the stage races we can go to the Quebec calendar, any of the Ontario TTs that any of us are kind of close to. I'll be mm-hmm. doing like all the OBC TTs as well, just to get the, the race experience and everything. Yeah, keep your legs yeah. going. Wow. Yeah, I know it's it's kind of hard um, trying to get figure out where to go, but I'm glad that Quebec has kind of moved mm-hmm. forward really quickly. Yeah, I mean, patio season is in full swing I know. right now. So. <laughs> it's just like old times. Just cross the bridge, go over to Quebec. Yeah, take my, my bike and go to Chelsea Pub. Like, That's right. Yeah, anyway, I, I can go get a freaking bike on a patio right now. Yeah, <laughs> no place on the bike. Yeah, that's right. So, oh my gosh, so that's awesome. We're going to be continuing to watch you for sure and support you. I know that you're in our club page now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll share this uh, this episode with everybody for sure. But I just want to thank you, Lucy, um, for sharing. I know that you touched on some, um, you know, some sensitive stuff uh, at the beginning, but I'm, you know, it's good that you st- you talk about that and be more open. Um mm-hmm. Because, that's the only uh, like talking about that kind of thing is the only way that other people will open up about it too because like it's the kind of thing better. you can really you can feel really alone about that kind of thing because mm-hmm. it's very much like something that you can say that's all in your head but so many people especially female athletes like feel like those are real real feelings that need to be acknowledged and talked about and you, you know I actually um <clears throat> I spoke with Alan Dempsey. I don't know if you've come across him yet, mm-hmm. um, but he was talking about male eating disorders in the Peloton. Yeah. 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 I can only imagine there's like such a, a deep issue there as well. Cause like, if, if I've learned anything, it's that like the whole like weight saving thing in cycling is like, it can be kind of like a little, like it can be a joke sometimes, but a lot of the time it's not a joke and people yeah. really internalize it and like <clears throat> practice it and it becomes like a big spiraling out of control yeah. full-blown eating disorder before you know it yeah I was surprised I shouldn't be surprised but I was yeah yeah, yeah. usually you equate that stuff with women but I'm mm-hmm. so grateful that you brought that forward and you can you know be an advocate for that so thanks again, Lucy. And I want to thank our listeners. And don't forget to like, comment, share. And also Lucy and I would love a, a review and five stars, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, and also give us your biggest takeaway. And please share this with somebody you know who could benefit from um, our discussion. And, um, and thanks again. We will. There we go. Like bring it to an end. Have an amazing day. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you. Hold on.